it's got a larger uh, frontal section to it and when it's impacting we're pushing more stuff out of the way and that's not insignificant that is that's something that should be considered in a projectile although mark and i both agree both of these bullets if placed inside the thoracic of a white tail a mule deer a pronghorn an axis whatever that's a dead critter All right, what is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here, once again, joined by my good friend, Ryan Muckenhern. Uh, if you hear a light clicking, if you hear a light clicking or are watching on YouTube, you're going to see that he's got a uh, some pincers, some large pincers. tweezers. Pincers. I think crabs have pincers. Now you, you have pincers, too. I think it's funny that you say pincers and not pinchers. I would have said pinchers. But P- pincers sounds way better. It uh, sounds a little more smart. Yeah, you talk about your pincer strength. You don't talk about your pincher strength. Yeah. Anyway, Ryan has these pincers because if you're also watching on YouTube, and if you're not, I'm going to tell you, we've got two large, about 100-pound gelatin blocks. Yeah, give her. You're, you might have heard that, too. That's what gelatin sounds like when you slap it. That was, uh, was okay. I've heard you do better. Uh if on the gelatin okay we will edit that um a little bit of a, a history of how we ended up here mm-hmm. we d- Ryan and I did a podcast a cartridge talk as we often do we do and we we're talking about the 65 versus the 308 yeah and that left us with some questions at at the end some un- unanswered questions so then we bought a bunch of gel we got a lot more than what's here. In fact, we have two more that we'll bring in. They'll, they'll probably be like a hard cut eventually where we bring in the other two gel blocks. But then we got a lot, even, a lot more after that. We did some shooting with the 6.5 and the 308 with a couple different bullet options. And that's kind of that's what we have here. And that's, I, that's what we're going to discuss. Is we discussed the results in the video. It's hard for... There's so many things going on here. There's right? a lot going on. So describe what we did... And even though this is being videoed too, but yeah. we made like a specific video where we did this testing. Yes. If you didn't see the video, we'll give you a quick breakdown. Um, two rifles, two calibers, uh, two different loads for each rifle. So we did a pretty standard cup and core projectile. In this case, we're using the Federal Power Shock Soft Point, and then a homogeneous or monolithic bullet design. In this case, a Barnes TSX in the Federal premium loading for the 6.5 Creedmoor and Federal's Trophy Copper, 165 grain projectile in the Federal premium Trophy Copper line. Uh, because we wanted to see, like these are two very distinctly different bullets and they, they, they do the same thing, but they do it differently. How do these two cartridges contend with each other? How do they stack up? Which one's the better choice? Um, we also evaluated the different loadings on the marketplace. So at, at press time, we kind of went through everybody's ammunition. We used the big manufacturers here in the U.S. Anyway, went through all their available ammunition offerings, um, audited the the number of offerings for a given cartridge, and then unique bullet styles or profiles. So think um, a varmint projectile, a long-range match projectile, an inexpensive target projectile, a hunting bullet, um, whether that's like a, a, a soft point or a ballistic tip of some kind. Bonded bullet. Correct. Um, compiled all of this wonderful stuff. Um, used that as a, a metric or a measuring stick to to try to determine which is the best choice. Um, we did have two rifles in each respective chambering. They were different. And so we had to try to figure out, okay, how do we... How do we evenly stack these two? We had to standardize it in a way. We do, because they are two very different rifles. We'll dive into that a little bit, too, here today. Um, so what we did is, yeah, the guns pushed the bullets down the barrel and into our gelatin. But we said, for the sake of math, that they both weighed eight pounds um, and had no other uh, like extraneous forces at work. There was no... Um, you know, subjectivity of muzzle brake influence or suppressor influence or stock design and things that would otherwise change the, um, like the driving experience for the rifle when you're shooting it. Uh, we call that shootability. So how, how easy is it to get behind the gun, pull the trigger, um, recover, get back on target, you know, whether that's felt recoil, torque, whatever you want to call it, just how 
pleasant could it be to shoot? Um, and we tried to do it with removing any biases. So we just base weight eight pounds, right? Um, so we shot the blocks, of course. We measured depth penetration of the projectile. We took a cursory glance at what wound channels and wound cavities looked like. Um, we're going to recover projectiles today, which I'm very excited about. We're going to weigh them um, and, you know, try to get as much of a three-dimensional picture of what this bullet is doing, um, you know, in flight and up upon impact. Um, and, and again, let's re-caveat the gelatin because I'm certain somebody's going to notice that this is not 10% ordnance gelatin, which it's not. Which at this point in time, Ryan, I'm extremely glad for. Correct. 10% uh, ordnance gelatin, which is uh, one of those standardized testing mediums, um, is a phenomenal product. A couple of challenges that we would have had using 10% or gel. One, it's not shelf stable. So, And these have been on shelves for some time well, some time now yes uh pulled on and off shelves several Man times handled manipulated we haven't dropped them no um and they are slippery trout when you pick them up it's like, you do feel like you're holding some sort of giant fish yeah large salmonoid um they they weigh like 100 to 110 pounds so they're they're quite porky um it's clear 10% or is not. So we wanted to be able to see what was going on in here or, or depict or show what was going on in here. Um, this stuff's called, it's a really cool product, right? So it, it does a very, very good job uh, encapsulating everything that we needed to do, right? It's, it's clear. It acts like ballistic gelatin. Um, well, and again, like, like you talked about with assigning a base weight to the rifle, right? Yeah. It, is it perfect? No. 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 Is it consistent? As, as consistent cons as we could make it. Yeah. As we could make it. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's probably you know there's probably a little bit of variance between the blocks themselves, sure. right? I'm sure that's having some sort of effect on the end result. But I think I think we got pretty close here for creating you know a pretty standard test platform with you know admittedly. Um, just a couple different projectiles, you know, kind of, you know, from, you know, somewhat opposite ends of the spectrum there, but maybe you can extra extrapolate the in-between a little bit. I mean, I mean, if any person out there, any reasonable person, you'd realize that there's a lot of projectiles out there. A lot. And I'd say this too, you know, um, these are very different and I don't want this to get into a, oh, a, uh, a lead versus copper. No. Like we're trying to uh, skew one way or the other. No. Nope. Um, those are the options that we use. You, you know I'm the biggest fan of copper. Right. That there could be. Um, stay tuned because I'm going to pick it apart and scrutinize its performance capabilities. With them, with your pincers? With my pincers. Mark, have we caveated this to death? <sighs> I hope so. Okay. Can we <laughs> pull it out yet? So... We're not ballisticians. We're enthusiastic hunters and shooters. Yes. And we want to understand a little bit more as to what is going on here and hopefully help you understand, you know, w what cartridge is a good choice and why. Yeah. Um, should we, I guess, I think we can't have this discussion without kind of a spoiler alert because I think it'll play into the discussion. Spoil away? Uh, hopefully you already watched the video. If you haven't, go watch it. Maybe hit pause here and then go watch it yeah. if you don't want me to ruin everything for you. 6-5 uh, Creedmoor came out on top. <clears throat> I only say that. Every, people love to hate the 6-5. I don't. Knock on wood, it performs very well for me. We'll unpack that a little too. Yeah. Um, so you brought up the categories. And I think, well, so, let's, so the 6-5 Creedmoor won in... Shootability. Shootability. It's a it's a it's a more gentle cartridge to shoot. Indeed. Uh, drop and drift. Yep. It's it, flatter shooting. Flatter shooting. It's bucks more, the wind better. Bucks the wind better. It's more it's just the 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 six five Creedmoor bullets are pass through the air more efficiently. Yes. Um. Third one. Terminal oh, performance. Terminal performance. We saw better penetration out of the six fives in both the lead and the copper. And that's to be expected. It's a smaller bullet diameter. Um, higher sectional density, uh, that is 
to be anticipated. Right. And then you could say, you could probably argue a little bit, though, like, okay, you're you're basing that win off of kind of like a single metric when there, when there are other metrics at play. Oh, yes. So, yeah. Again, I feel like there's we're caveating things to the max, but also like there's just so many things at play here. And actually, that's, that's why we're having this podcast. Yeah. Because we can really dive into some of this more nuanced stuff that's just like difficult when you're trying to create like a shorter, concise, but also informational video. Sure. Um. So yeah, the six five penetrated more. It did. Uh, lighter weight bullet. Marginally though. So in the cup and core offering, so Federal Power Shock, we used a hundred and fifty grain thirty caliber projectile in the three hundred eight, a hundred and forty grain projectile in the six five. Ten grains is not. It's not insignificant, but it's also not the difference between one hundred and thirty and one hundred and eighty. Not monumental. No, no, no. So yeah, they're a little bit lighter, but again. You know, longer bullet profile, higher sectional density, higher BC, better retained velocity, can all lead, would all lead, should all lead to better penetration at distance. Is that something that, okay, those things are not attributes that I've ever thought of when considering terminal performance. Sure. Should I be? I think that depends. I think that that's why we... We do a video like this. Like, does that matter? Did it matter to you before? Does it matter now? Uh, when I look at it, I think in a vacuum, yeah, maybe it does. Although I'll make changes to my projectile style for a given cartridge to exploit one of those things. So not to skip ahead and talk about 308, but I shoot 130 green barns TTSX out of my 308. I have a solid copper bullet that is probably going to shed Less well, not probably, but guaranteed to shed less weight than a cup and core bullet in a six five that has a similar launch weight. So I have retained velocity or retained um, mass. I generally have a little higher velocity because I have a larger surface area on the back of the bullet for uh, propellant gases to push on. That load out of my little Kimber is moving thirty one fifty. You know we're we're at a huge advantage in velocity over the the six five. Um, so I'm going to say it could matter if you want it to matter. Um, I, I selected that particular projectile for penetrative capability uh, for weight retention, which is, uh, again, also pouring into penetration. Uh, also to induce as much hydrostatic shock upon impact as possible to disrupt tissue, to destroy tissue internally, to destroy structures. Um, and I like 308. Like it's a really useful and versatile cartridge. Uh, that being said, I also have multiple six fives, and I kill a lot of stuff with both. <laughs> really good cartridges, but I think it, it it can matter. It it depends on what you're looking to do. If you wanted to hunt large game with a small cartridge like six five Creedmoor, and it is a smaller cartridge, right? Um, you want a bullet that will get to the place it needs to go if you have the opportunity to get it there. So whether that's you know through a deep deep thoracic cavity, so like think an elk. Um, I've never killed an elk, but I've been next to elk. Mark, you've taken apart numerous elk that you've killed. From the surface of the hide to the center line of the body, how deep are we talking? I guess I've never measured it. Elbow deep? Oh, yeah, at least, yeah. Probably probably about that, yeah. How wide is a whitetail? I don't know. I've never done the math. It's probably about the same depth, so like a, yeah. an elk could be considered twice as deep as a whitetail well that might matter right if you need to get a bullet to the heart and lungs and through the heart and lungs um, one that can penetrate better is going to be a good choice certainly or a frontal shot or a quartering away shot something where you have to punch a projectile through a considerable amount of other tissue in order to hit the good stuff absolutely then i think it matters we talk about that a lot here we were just talking about it the other day on a different podcast um but i do think I could be wrong. Um, we often think think in terms of that perfect broadside shot. Sure. And just like oftentimes shots are not that perfect broadside shot. Correct. So with that example, here's yes. where if I was shooting these two bullets and that was the shot opportunity that I was presented, one of them, the 6.5, I believe presents me with a more viable terminal package. Mm-hmm. 
No doubt. I think it's fair. It's fair to say off of, you know, the findings of, of this experiment. Yeah. Um, and like you said, this is, this is about <clears throat> as accessible and traditional a bullet design mm-hmm. as you'll get. Yep. You know, I'd say it's reminiscent of uh, like a Remington core lock. Yep. That's a, that's a bullet that a lot of folks shoot at deer. A Sierra Game King, a Hornady interlock or an interbond. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We, uh, so yeah, we got more penetration, you know, probably higher because you started with a higher weight, you know, I mean the, the, the 308 pills just a little bit bigger. Um, looking at the permanent wound cavity, the, they're not too different. They're not. I would say from that. From what I can tell. I would say, and we'll get into this. Actually, you know what? <laughs> Perfect time to do so, Mark. Uh, we've got a couple of assisting visual aids here to help us highlight and show you these cavities if you're watching i do encourage you to watch this is an interactive course (laughs) so mark's talking about permanent wound cavity here you can see where there's material displaced in the block like it looks like there's a cloud floating in there that's that permanent wound cavity and you can see where the bullet trails off uh, and comes down now a temporary wound cavity or temporary wound channel wouldn't be visible here you can see it on the high speed video where we feel and that's like the space that that opens up to there's your there's your temporary and this is your permanent your permanent is always displaced right it's pretty it's pretty amazing to watch Mm -hmm. that displacement yes in the video i'll say this and and you'll have to look at the videos yourself to to make this call the 308 disrupts the block more than the 65 creedmoor Mm-hmm. There's no question about it. I attribute that to one, it has more mass. Two, it's got a larger uh, frontal section to it. And when it's impacting, we're pushing more stuff out of the way. And that's not insignificant. That is, that's something that should be considered in a projectile. Although Mark and I both agree, both of these bullets, if placed inside the thoracic of a whitetail, a mule deer, a pronghorn, an axis, whatever. That's a dead critter. There's there's no doubt about I, that. I don't think a person's going to see uh, <clears throat> a different no. end result. One thing, I, we got to go back and we got to caveat something else. Uh-oh. There's no bone. There's no hide. There's no blood. There's no variable tissue density in throughout. Here's another challenge with using any kind of ballistics gelatin. Uh, a, a critter is very different than this. This is fairly constant through and through. You can see there's a couple of bubbles and inclusions in there, and that would, you know, possibly goof things up but when you think about like a whitetail if you've ever if you've ever scun and quartered a whitetail out like how tough hide is i mean it's tough it catches bullets on the backside it's tough it's elastic yep yep and all of that every time a projectile we've talked about this in the terminal ballistics podcasts that we've done with the guys at hornady every time a bullet encounters some sort of structure some sort of tissue it's losing a little bit of the battle every every time right uh, so yes, your hide is very elastic and it, it has like a catcher's mid effect on that projectile. Hair is, is a kind of a tough thing to get through sometimes depending on your species. Once you get through the hide and you start to encounter, like I said, that variable tissue density and we're looking at fat tissue, adipose tissue, we're looking at muscle tissue, we're looking then at bone and cartilage and sinew and things that are, again, rock hard or bone hard to, you know, fairly hard like a cartilage. Um, and then once you break through, uh, you know, the thoracic wall and you get into like the chest cavity itself, then you hit like lungs and heart. They're pretty soft. Which, yeah, if you've ever, you know, yeah. gutted a deer or something, yeah. I mean, you just know how goo. Goo is correct. But l- looking at the two, speaking specifically to the wound channels, 6.5, unquestionably deeper. Mark, let's get a let's get an eyeball on that. Let's see. We've got some of this written down, so we better make sure that we yeah, say we the same Yeah, we've got to be consistent. Thing. It's like 27 inches. I'll uh, move it down a little bit here. Hold on a sec. Hold on. We'll call it uh, 27 and a quarter or close to that. Yeah, close okay. to that. I think I've got, for some reason, down. I've got 25 and 9 sixteenths. Maybe that was measured from down a different part of the block. Let me look at this. Oh, gosh. Dad's got to check my work here. Measure twice, cut once. Regardless, yeah. it went a little more. Yep. And the 308 poking in there at about um, 20 and a half, 21, somewhere in there. 
Yeah, 19 and three quarters, I think, is what we sure. got. So, yeah, like Mark said, 6.5 does more, no doubt. Um, wound cavities, very similar. I still give it to the 308 just a little bit. And, and again, it's a larger projectile, larger frontal surface area. It's displacing more material as it's being pushed through there. As that bullet gets disrupted, it's getting disrupted to a larger diameter as well. So, right. something to think about. One thing I thought was uh, somewhat curious, as consistent of a medium as this is, yeah. well, and, and we saw this consistently, though, the bullets of the cup and cores almost always ended up pointing backwards. Flipping backwards. That, uh, th- that's explainable to me, right? So we get this big sail out front, okay, so oh, as the bullet sure. opens, right? right? And then some part of it is probably going to open a little bit more, and it's going to start acting as a break. Sure. And then that bullet's going to invert. And most of them ended up with, and you may be able to see it in the video, where the, the base of the bullet is oriented almost straight down, if not slightly, more toward the end of the block. And they all, all the cup and cores did that, every one of them that we fired. We mm-hmm. shot quite a few bullets mm-hmm. that day. And every one of them had that kind of, that yaw to them as they were as they were impacting and traversing the block. Um, something else to be expected with, with cup and cores, and I've never seen an exception to this, is secondary fragmentation, yeah. which I don't know that it's a bad thing. Um, that's another piece of material that's going through that has a, a possibility to collapse along puncture an artery. Um, you know, cut a vital nerve uh, that's controlling something like legs. Um, so a, se- a secondary fragment isn't a bad thing, but you'll hear folks talk about that quite a bit too. Uh, uh, homogenous projectiles generally not going to lose hardly anything. Um, these do, and that's when we'll get into weight retention here in a little bit. I'm really excited to pluck a bullet out. Mark. I I am as well. I'm going to throw one more one more thing yeah. out there though. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this on a podcast the other day. We'll probably, maybe a lot of this we'll talk about every time we, you know, compare a cartridge or do one of these or fire bullets into gel. But you have different, um, people subscribe to different theories of what they want a bullet to do. Everybody wants the same result, uh, but some people subscribe to different theories of doing things a different way. So, and one person, like, we'll just say, which I think probably, like, if this was a broadside deer, my gut would tell me that this bullet exits out the other side, right? Or at the least, it's hung in the hide. Or hung in the hide. I guess where I'm going with that, though, but, like, some people want the bullet to stay in and transfer all that uh, energy, and other people want that bullet to drive and go through the animal, creating two holes, and and also take advantage of that long track of penetration if it's needed. Sure. So, anyway. That's that. Should we grab one? Can I? <laughs> Would you? Oh my gosh, yes. I'm gonna see how Let's well see this little We've got some backups here. This tweezers works. Yeah, we also have a needle nose pliers. You know what would have been real keen is a hemostat. We'll have to do that. I think we're gonna have to resort to the pliers. We don't want to damage the subject. No, I'm gonna try to open up the little cavity here a little bit so I can draw it out. Bear with me, folks. Uh play the Jeopardy theme song. Got it. There she goes. That's a projectile. All right. So stuff the guts back in. Yeah. Good enough for now. Let's get this. That was it's the 140 grain power shock is fired from the 6.5 Creedmoor. Brian's got a scale here. Yeah. A so digital scale. We talk about the differences in bullets, right? And while I'm firing up the scale, I'm gonna say like the results you see here today. Could be drastically changed by a different bullet. Yeah, go ahead. And, and by that I mean, okay, this is a traditional soft point projectile. Where'd your uh, tweezers go? Right here. Traditional soft point projectile, right? So not the highest BC, not the slipperiest profile bullet on the market. Um, as you're looking at this wound channel, uh, the retained weight, uh, you know, if you're looking at the drop and drift charts that we had put up. Uh, results will vary when you change that projectile. So if you switch bullets to, say, a Hornady SST or an ELDX or a Nosler Acubond or an Acubon Long Range or a Swift Scirocco or I- any other higher BC projectile, you're, or, or for that matter, any other projectile, you're going to see something a little bit different. So this isn't to say this is all a 6.5 Creedmoor will do or this is, right. you, you know. It's not a definitive no, result. No, it's a good it example. It is a result. Yeah, it's a good example, though. 
Um, that's one thing we were talking about the other day, though. Like, I feel like um, we used, like I said, bullets kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum. Yep. And then it's like, so what is like, uh, you know, an Acubond or Swift Scirocco or something um, more in the middle, I guess, if you will. Like, what would that have looked like if we shot those into gel? And we don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, somebody has shot those bullets into gel, assuredly, but um, we have not. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to get the most accurate results possible, and by that, that people, if you're watching, I'm uh, meticulously trying to remove the. I removed a lot of material though. Look at that. You did. Can so see, let's see how much the material weighs. Yeah, that I throw it on up there. Does it even register? One grain. <laughs> see. Uh, so the bullet expanded to nominally three quarters of an inch. Which is really damn good when you think about it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So about three quarters of an inch is what it opened up to. Um, fired weight was 140 grains. Recovered weight was 137.5. Three grains is lost. That's impressive. It is. And again, I think that would have been different if there was bone, hide, muscle, fat. I think we would have lost more weight. And when you look through there, there's not a lot of secondary fragmentation. But you encounter a structure like a scapula or some ribs, pieces are coming up. It's going to change some things. Yeah. So into the gel, 137.5 grains of retained weight. Pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. Um, to your point, Mark, dead critter, right? No doubt about it. And then, again, like, the variables are infinite. Let's say you put that thing on the point of a front, sh front shoulder quartering yep. two deer. Yep. Um, yeah, you might lose some material off the bullet. That material might go somewhere else. It's also creating an immense amount of shock that likely in that situation, you know, that deer is going to, or whatever is going to keep the bullet with it. It's going to transfer everything that it's got. Um, you know, and, I'm, and I've talked to guys at bullet companies and they're like, you know, or you might be like, yeah, I question the performance of the bullet. And they're like, well, what happened? It died. Okay. I've had that conversation. You know, okay. I, I've, been, I've, right. been the, I've been the customer questioning the performance. And then it's funny because I recovered. Then you feel the, like an idiot. Yeah, I recovered the critter. Uh, I was dead. It didn't do what my expectation was. Um, yeah. Let's get All that right. Let's get that 30 out of there. Yep. Would you, um, Mark, would you like me to make a small incision in the block? Doctor. This one's really centered and quite deep. So that looks about right. If you didn't shoot the darn thing in the exact center. I'm sorry. I think this was you. Oh, that could have been me. Oh, now, thank heavens. Now, now we're cooking with gas. Uh, Go yes. ahead, Mark. Oh, thank heavens. Oh, we did it, people. Gracious. My goodness. I don't think we really How they took read? much material off in our... <laughs> No, I think the projectile's fine. Block. There's a mess. Um, okay. So this is the 30 cal projectile, 150 grain. Correct. So welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Took us a little bit longer than anticipated. Ryan is tweezing out the uh, remnants of the ballistic gel that are contained within the mushroom of the bullet there. Acceptable. So, 150 grain fired weight, recovered weight of 145.4. Okay. So, we lost a little bit more material, I guess, relative to the starting weight on this one. <clears throat> but here again, we see characteristic mushroom. Oh, I forgot to get you an expanded measurement on that one. It's pretty serious. Yeah, that's, that's a big bullet. So, seven eighths, seven eighths of an inch. Beat out that 6.5 by about an eighth of an inch. Not insignificant. Uh, you know, and this is always tough because I don't like looking at tests like this and be like, well, that bullet's bigger, so it did more damage. Well, one went definitely deeper. Um, the wound cavity on the 308's a little bit longer. Um, the permanent, like the bigger disruptive materials, a little mm -hmm. bit longer, a mm -hmm. little bit wider. Both are so 
darn close to each other from a performance standpoint that I can't believe that one won. I'm actually kind of surprised. Well, I mean, I guess we already covered it. But, um, yeah, the 6.5 did penetrate significantly more. Uh, after digging those bullets out, though, I do wonder, that is a dense material. Oh, yeah. Through and through, that is a very dense material. Absolutely. So, you're. it's hard to, like, in my mind, I'm, like, judging penetration on, like, um, I'm equating the block to, say, a deer, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know if that's at, like, I probably shouldn't be. It's the only thing that I can translate it to. Sure. Because they are different mediums, like we said, with with the deer or any yes. animal being variable. Yes. You know, depending on a number of things. But um, that said, though, if you t- made me pick between the two of these projectiles, I'd probably go with the 6.5. Sure. I want to talk about the rifles a little bit more. You know, when you look at the accessibility, the availability, the shootability, the versatility, et cetera, et cetera, you may draw your own conclusions on that. I think you can, Mark and I were talking about this ahead of the podcast. Like, I own both of those rifles, mm-hmm. right? Um, I like my rig, my rig set up kind of a particular way. I like a, a trimmer stock, um, which I, I will suffer a little bit from a handling characteristic. Like, it, it's harder to shoot those guns. Oh, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, both of the guns are equipped with muzzle brakes. There's a little bit of a weight disparity between them. Um, you know, the Kimber's coming in at six pounds, two and a half ounces loaded. The the teak is right around seven and a quarter or so um, unloaded. So, yeah, the the six five is going to have a little bit less recoil just because it's got more mass and it's sucking up a little bit of that. And of course, the six five is generating less recoil. But something I think that should be important to note is like, let's say you were dead set on shooting a three oh eight, like. For whatever reason you had, um, you feel the 308 is the better cartridge choice, which I'm not going to argue with it. I think it's a fantastic cartridge choice. If recoil was a concern, mitigation of recoil is, is really actually quite easy to do, mm-hmm. either by adding a muzzle brake, mm-hmm. adding a suppressor, changing stock geometry. So that particular stock, again, it's very um, English style, if you will, very trim dimension, short forend, open grip. You know, if you were to put that into um, a rifle stock that had a, a more vertical presentation of the grip, maybe a little bit higher comb angle, um, something like that, that you can be more stable, it's going to change the dynamic of the rifle tremendously, the driving experience, if that's what you want to call it. Well, and both those rifles are relatively lightweight oh, rifles. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say particularly the Kimber, yep. right? Um, just selecting a rifle that's maybe a little, have has a little more substance to it. Sure. But again, depending on what you're doing. Right. You know, you might want, if you're, you know, well, it, going it, deep in the backcountry and a lot of miles and want a lightweight rifle. Even even you and I have differing opinions on stock design. Um, you put your precedence on the shootability of that stock, how it feels, how it fits, how you can drive it and control it. And that's going to change the entire dynamic of shootability. Mm-hmm. So I'm not trying to blow that category out of the water and say, well, it's kind of a tricky one to be valid with. But it's true. I mean, if if you do design the rifle to be a very shootable rifle from like a, a configuration standpoint of stock or the addition of a muzzle brake or suppressor, um, you're going to be able to take a higher recoiling, harder to shoot cartridge like 308, and you're going to tame it down to next to nothing, you know? Um, and the same could be said with the 6.5. I mean, you're already starting with a very, very easy cartridge to shoot, and you're just making it easier to shoot. And that Tika is extraordinarily easy to shoot. I shot it a, just sits there. I shot a mule deer with it um, in November, and I sh- that deer was pretty close. It was 114 yards. And the, generally, the closer you are, the harder it is to observe what's happening in the scope sure. through the recoil. Um, I shot him on 6 power, and... When I pulled the trigger, I watched the bullet hit him. Like, I watched, you know, the the whole reaction from the trigger press to the boom whop. And that's impressive. Like you said, that's a close shot yeah. to recover yep. from recoil and yep. be able to see that. But, like, that's why I have a break on that gun. Like, I don't need a break on a 6.5. But I really like the control that I do get out of it. And the same thing with the 308. That little Kimber's a handful to shoot without the break on it. With the break on it, it's quite pleasant. Well, it's it's way more pleasant. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the six five still tars and feathers it, but uh, so for for shootability addressing that, I think anything can be amended within right. the equation, and without adding a disparaging amount of weight or clunkiness to the rifle or features that don't make it conducive for you know porting over long distances in the backcountry. Stock design goes a long way. A really efficient muzzle brake goes a long way. A really good suppressor goes a long way, uh, and you can you can change that you know dynamic considerably. Um, that next category, accessibility. It's true. There's more 308 the cartridge has been around since the 50s. The 65 Creedmoor was released in 2007. That's an expectation that we have. It's it's caught on like wildfire. I mean, it's it's one of the most popular cartridges that we've tested. Looking at all the numbers, mm-hmm. um, you made a really good point about accessibility. Yes, there's more, and I don't remember if that one was on air. Yes, there's more options for the 308, but are is that better? Because right. because are the options available for the 65 Creed more optimized? Are they the right options? Correct. Exactly. And I look at I look at seven PRC. Not that this is a seven PRC podcast, but I look at seven PRC and I wonder the same thing. There's a very limited amount of loaded ammunition for it. The choices that you have are outstanding. You have a long range hunting bullet, a long range match bullet, and a very hard hitting monolithic projectile, that one sixty CX. What what other three bullets would technically need to exist in that space to accomplish a task better? And I don't know the answer. And I, I think that there's a lot of merit in what you're saying. Um, so I'm not going to crown the, the 308 as the uh, you know, undisputed champion of the world just because there was 96 factory offerings out there. That is a significant talking point. There's 308 a lot of places that you go. Uh, but there's also a lot of 6.5 Creedmoor. And generally speaking, the 6.5 Creedmoor ammunition out there shoots really good in the 6.5 Creedmoor guns that are also out there. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a very important thing to note with this. Selection is optimized the more modern we get in the cartridge um the drop and drift i think is pretty indisputable yeah i mean the 308 long time highly touted sure as i mean yeah i mean i guess it's something of lore like oh that's what the snipers use you know um six five beats it hands down handle and you know with drop and drift yep and and with every hunting load with the exception of a couple, because I'm doing goofy stuff with them, every hunting load out there pretty much follows suit. Mm-hmm. You have a, a more aerodynamic projectile that its in-flight characteristics over distance show a more forgiving, easier to shoot, higher probability to hit target option. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And as you know, people oftentimes these days are interested in interested in extending their effective range sure. within the effectiveness of the cartridge, yep. right? Uh, we're talking, you know, the bullet has enough, you know, velocity for proper expansion, things like that. Uh, but you, you just that wind deflection yep. is, it's, a, it's being able to significantly mitigate that yep. is a pretty big deal because you need the bullet to go where it needs to go. Should we look at the other bullets? We sh- I forgot we had them. I know it. Let's do it. Oh, oh yeah. And we're back. And we're back. We're here. We so we can get our hernias taken care of later. Is it? Yeah. Is it supposed to be poking out like that? Those are heavy. Uh, heavy and awkward. Yep. We covered that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube. You, you'll see that we have two new blocks here. They're intact. We don't. We, we haven't mined through these yet. We, no, uh, <laughs> we've got the copper projectiles. Yeah. Uh, one, the three hundred eight, a one sixty five grain uh, trophy copper. Yep. The other is the six five Creedmoor, one thirty grain, uh, with the Barnes TSX. Correct. Um. I'd say, you know, similar projectiles in, yeah. in some ways. Yep. Um, I would say a dramatic uh, reduction in penetrative difference between the two. Correct. They're much more even Steven. Which is just, it really goes to show how projectile selection can affect 
terminal performance. Oh, yes. So if you aren't watching on YouTube, the 6.5 Creedmoor and the 308 have both, they haven't doubled their penetration over the last test, over the lead, but they're not, well, actually the 308 would have um, pretty close to double it, which is very characteristic of copper. Mm-hmm. This is this is what we've come to expect out of the copper projectiles available in the marketplace. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in a little bit, I'm going to critique them too, because there's some things that we absolutely want to consider if you're going to shoot these projectiles. Um, let's get our let's get our visual aid uh, assistant assistant up here so we can examine these wound channels. Boy, I'll tell you, these blocks clarified real nice. They did. Yeah. So if you are watching on YouTube, you get to you get to see a couple of those bullets in there. Top here being the 130 grain Barnes TSX, bottom being the 165 um, Trophy Copper. So <clears throat> I'll take a quick measurement on here. Uh, we're at like 35 and a half on the 308. Um, let's go up to the the old 65 here, and uh, about 37 and three quarter. Uh, is what I'm doing with a quick measurement here. This may vary a little bit from the numbers we measured when we were on it, the range. It but does, yeah. I don't know why there's such a variance. Well, here. I'm, I'm measuring from perhaps a different side of the block, and I wasn't squared up with it. So I'm in, inducing parallax, in fact. there's that a, could... we're, we're talking about optics, sort of. Uh, so the 6.5, the 308 have definitely increased their penetrating capability with the copper projectile. Again, this should be an expectation. I do think you do notice a little bit of a difference in the wound cavity layout. Um, it doesn't seem to me in, in the testing that we did that the wound cavities on the initial are as large, it, meaning like their height, if we were to look at them two-dimensionally. Sure. They seem ever so slightly smaller. It's very difficult to measure it because it is a, a, a you know multi-dimensional space in there. But one thing that we definitely see with these is they are way longer. Yes. Like we're, when we're seeing considerable tissue damage, and, and not just that they, the bullets are penetrating farther, but like the actual wound cavity, when you're looking at it, you're like, you're seeing large segments of disrupted block. So I'm pointing here at the block. Um, I don't know if you can see it behind Mark's hat there, but like the cavity depth is much longer on the the copper projectiles. And then it, it seems on the lead projectiles, on the end of their their route as they're going through the block, you end up with like this little pencil hole mm-hmm. as it's pushing through the block. The copper projectiles, and I've often equated, like I shoot a lot of barns specifically, I, I tell folks they're like a ninja bullet blender going through that target. So copper being not as malleable as lead mm-hmm. uh, and being much, much heavier than the thin copper or copper alloy jackets that we see in a lot of bullets, those pedals aren't moving very easily out of the way. So th- I don't think that they're fixed um, in position, but they're not moving so easily out of the way. And while they're rotating through that target, whatever that is, they are absolutely and positively shredding stuff um, the whole way they go, um, assuming they expand. And this is, this is that caveat. As, as a huge proponent of, of these projectiles, I say you have to consider your impact velocity on target for success. If you breach that threshold, what I call the minimum velocity threshold, uh, and you're under it, I don't think you expect or you, you observe stellar results. Basically, what we're doing is we don't have enough energy and velocity on target to open that projectile, like initiate mechanical expansion mm-hmm. of the bullet itself. And you end up with an under, uh, an under uh, expanded projectile going through that. And on, you know, a worst case scenario, you observe little to none and you end up penciling through. Now, the argument here is it's still going through the good stuff. And if you hit the heart, you hit the heart. And that's probably a dead critter. And if we poke holes in the lungs, that's probably a dead critter, but you might not see the the expected result. It might not be the boom flop, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So with these, while we look at this this penetration and this terminal performance and this test as outstanding, like holy buckets, it blew the the lead out of the water, sort of. It did it at a hundred yards. I that you just brought up exactly what I was gonna say. Yes. And so we still had very high impact velocity on target 
And this is something you must consider if you're going to shoot these projectiles. I do not enter the field having the expectation that the projectile like this that I use is going to perform at six, seven, eight, nine hundred yards. I don't shoot that far because of these projectiles. I don't, I don't believe that they're going to deploy reliably with some of the cartridges that I use or some of the cartridges that I use because my impact velocity is below a certain threshold. <clears throat> so fantastic choice if you're careful on your range, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you're looking at your drop charts and you're saying, okay, this is where I draw the line. And for me, with most of the guns I shoot, a couple of outliers in the larger ones, it's about 600 yards. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a 243 or whether it's a 30-06 or a 6.5 cream or a 260 or a 280, it's about there. Which... That's a long way. Which on game? And that's pretty. That's pretty. Yep. Pretty far. I don't lose sleep at night anymore because of it. I used to think I was going to miss out, and, and then like the number of instances in which I've encountered shots that I could take. Like, and by that I mean I had the rest, I had the terrain, I had the wind, I had the shot angle. The number of opportunities that I've had, in in my experience, has been very limited mm-hmm. at distances beyond that. I'm certain they exist. I know they do. I don't come across them very often in mm-hmm. the terrain that I hunt and the, the species that I chase. So um, I love copper projectiles. Be mindful when you're using them that you do have to maintain uh, a certain velocity in order to get them to work properly. The result, if they don't, um, if you're outside of that window, less than stellar. Yep. Yeah, and not to say that, you know, lead projectiles won't do the job e- like like we were talking about before when we were looking at, at the, le- the lead versions, and, and particularly after digging into this material, it's like, this is dense. Yes. This is dense. I mean, I still think you have higher penetrative capabilities with the copper. Like, it's, it's evident. It's oh, clear. Yes. You know? Um, but uh, I think both would have worked, but this is quite impressive. It Absolutely. And, and when Mark's saying dense, it's dense because it's a pain in the butt for us to get into. But, like, you'll not take a blunt tip tweezers and you'll not push a blunt tip tweezers through a deer like that. Deer are denser yet. And then variable density like we talked about earlier. So, yeah, bullets do a darn good job through this. Um, and these bullets all would have done a darn good job through a living critter too. But, um, you know, curiously enough, I've, I've shot the barns for many years now, uh, coming up on two decades, uh, I've recovered exactly one. Interesting. In a critter. Most of my shots are broadside or broadside quartering away or quartering two. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not encountering nearly 40 inches of depth or breadth in the animal, but the one projectile that I did recover and we'll weigh these and we'll see where they end up, uh, was a mule deer that I shot, he was bedded facing me, and I hit him, and that bullet took like a 36-inch-plus journey. I didn't, like, lay him out and measure him, but, I, I, of course, I hit him in, like, you know, the throat, and I recovered that bullet between the hips in a lumbar vertebrae, and it actually went down, like, the spinal column itself. He probably didn't go very far, did uh, he? No, he rolled down a hill. Um, what was so amazing is, like, I had to excise the vertebrae itself and pop the projectile out of the hole in the mm-hmm. vertebrae. Um, fired weight was 130 grains. Recovered weight, 129. Delrin tip or plastic tip, whatever they make those tips out of on that bullet, one grain. So it's pretty cool. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, I didn't weigh any of these projectiles that I'm about to talk about, but I've recovered three. Yep. Uh, one was, I don't, rec- I, don't um, I think it would have been a trophy copper. It would have, it was out of a two seventy. I'm going to assume it was a one thirty or a one fifty grainer, perhaps. Is that a black tail? Stick to black tail, probably eighty yards, hard quartering, offhand shot. I remember which turned out at the end of the day it worked. But I remember pulling off his front shoulder because I didn't want to wreck his front shoulder. And like I said, he was hard quartering. Well, I pulled a little too far. I ended up putting it through his back ham. It quartered all the way through the deer. I mean, it ran through the majority of the deer and stopped, I think, just behind the shoulder or in the shoulder on the offside. Recovered that bullet. Like front of the shoulder? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. I just know that we found it. Yeah. Uh, and 
So got that one, and it looked picture perfect. Uh, the next one would have been a 165 grain uh, GMX. Shot a whitetail buck here in Wisconsin, probably about, I don't know, 100, 130 yards, something like that. Quartering shot, mid ribs, uh, ended up, uh, again, either in or behind the shoulder and the elastic of the hide. Picture perfect looking. And uh, same thing with an axis steer, like uh, like a big axis steer. Um, what do they like weigh? 150. They're like uh, a whitetail? It was like a big, it was like a whitetail buck. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, all relatively close shots. So I think before even doing this experiment, I would have thought, oh, the closer shot, it's more likely to blow through. Mm. And I don't, and, and now after doing kind of what we found here a little bit, although, although this is showing remarkable penetration, I think when we get into some of the future ones that we did, maybe this is more applicable to that conversation. But um, would you look at that? Oh. This was much easier than the last one. We yeah, to did that with the tweezers. That's pretty. Yeah, so Mark is alluding to, and, and we, we do touch on this later, um, the more impact velocity you have and the more energy you have on target, the faster it dumps that velocity and that energy. And the result might surprise you. The expectation would be it's going to blow completely through. Do you want to pluck the other one right away? Sure. Yeah. So you have the 6.5, uh, the six six correct? Right here. Uh, we, we oriented the blocks so that they were closer to the surface. Smart move. Yes. If you watch the video, the orientation that we have the blocks here right now is likely not the same. Ryan, what did you? What what magical thing did you do to pull that out the last time? I mean, you loosened it. <laughs> this is like when I had you open that jar of pickles for me. I just want you to know that I intentionally over tightened all the jars, so you had to ask me to <laughs> pull the jar of pickles out. You got it. Yeah, there it is. I didn't watch your big twist move that you had earlier. That's big the, twist guy. That's the key. Big twist guy. So there you have it. Um, yeah. So we're talking. I don't know if that'll get cut. We'll keep them. That was a good commentary while we were doing it. But yeah. um, the closer you are to to that target, and the higher your impact velocity, and the higher your energy is on target, the faster it's going to shed that. Um, that as well. So that's something to, to consider why Mark didn't have the exits. Um, and not to not to spoil it, we've got a surprising uh, future video coming out that, that exemplifies that wonderfully. Um, let's attack the, the copper weight here. So scale up, we're zeroed out. Uh, the 130 grain Barnes TSX, of course, launch weight of 130 grains, recovered weight of 130.2 grains. <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit of uh, detritus in there from the, the gelatin still under the pedals. Um, and again, absolutely textbook look. Now, something that I've read from critics of these projectiles is their expanded velocity is not as great as that or their expanded profile is not as great as that uh, of a lead core projectile. And that's not untrue. Um, so we're at about 0.555 inches at the widest point. And comparatively, we'll remeasure now that we have a dial caliper, proper tool. The lead is about 750. So yeah, you are you are getting a wider frontal area with the the lead projectile. There's no doubt about that. But the copper, I think, is still... A more effective tool it's more uniform it tracks truer through the target um you know those like i had mentioned earlier those pedals there become that ninja bullet blender running through that thing and if you do encounter difficult tissue like bone uh, or heavy hide or a lot of muscle tissue or just a lot of space that you got to get through on that critter that projectile wins that race every single time um in my experience anyway all right Mark's 165 trophy copper. I'll stand this thing on its Now, head. this would have been a tipped bullet, too. So there would have been a plastic tip on it. This is true. 164.2. So you lost. We lost the tip. Lost the tip. Yep. What do those tips weigh? We about a grain. Probably, about a grain? About a grain. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um. Quite impressive. Let me oh. see yours right there. Yeah, pedals... Uh, 
We'll get a, get a measurement on the diameter of that. 308. About 565. 565. 565. On the 6.5 Creed, it's about 5.55. Five, five. So not not a massive difference. I mean, we're 30 caliber and 6.5 caliber, and their expanded diameters are almost identical. You know, that's really interesting to see. It is. Yeah. So the question is, which one is the better tool in this case? And that's tough. That's a tough egg to crack. I think that. I think that's a huge testament to the 6.5s true uh, ferocity as a cartridge, like as an effective game-taking tool. It's with the right bullet. It's doing almost everything that the 308 is doing. It's over-penetrating comparatively, not over-penetrating. That is negative connotation. It's out-penetrating. And it's expanded to nearly the same diameter. That's something to think about. Now, energy on target is going to be different, too, because we have a launch velocity that's different. We have a mass differential here between these two projectiles. Mm -hmm. That's undisputable, right? If you encounter more resistance, i.e. shoulder, femur, um, you know, a whole bunch of tissue to get through, it, it's likely that the higher mass of the 308 is going to help with that. But, boy, does that turn the 6.5 Creedmoor into one wicked projectile or one wicked cartridge. Right. I mean, wow. I mean, there's certainly going to be instances where bigger is better. Yeah, there is oftentimes no argument for displacement, right? There's, that's unquestionable. But I think that this, this stands a, a good testament to the effectiveness of the cartridge when paired with the correct bullet, mm -hmm. depending on the application, right? Again, poor choice if you want to shoot this really far away. If you're expecting terminal results out of this projectile, like you see in the blocks or like you see this bullet expanded in my hand, that's not happening at at 800 yards, right? Not at all. Nor is this projectile. There's a better solution for that. You know, it's a thinner jacketed bullet with a very high BC, um, and that at those distances, at that at that longer distance, that thinner jacket isn't such a detriment. It's not like falling apart. It's acting more like what we experienced with the bonded bullet or that that traditional cup and core bullet, mm -hmm. right? Um, so again, I, I'll say this too many times. Match the projectile for the intended, you know, use, distance, et cetera, and expectation, right? I don't think that if you're, you know, the casual deer hunter, you need to go out and spend the money necessarily on premium hunting ammunition that employs a right. bullet like this. Like, that, that gets the job done. That's a dead white tail. Well, and it could, you know, it could be, if you don't shoot a 300 win mag, great, because of, you know, recoil and things like that, you can still do... <laughs> Some pretty serious work with a six five Creed, a absolutely, and a three hundred eight. But um, I guess to to continue to toot its horn, Mark, you nailed it. Like we shoot a lot. Do you shoot a three hundred short mag and a relatively lightweight rifle very well? I bet you shoot a light recoiling rifle and a lightweight rifle even better. Better, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a big there's a big thing I want to continued up kind of harp on with the, the Creedmoor is a really wonderful cartridge or cartridges similar to it. The cartridge you can shoot more often uh, is the one that you're going to be more confident with, right? Mm -hmm. It's the one that you're going to be more efficient with and thusly more effective with. Uh, that cartridge selection, I think, is brilliant for a lot of people, and myself included. Like, I am very recoil averse now. I shoot a lot for work. Um, and I don't like getting the tar kicked out of me when I'm on the range. I don't like the fact that I have a flinch that I can't seem to reconcile. That gun is so mild-mannered, I don't even think about it. Right. I'm so confident in my zeros with that gun, and I'm so confident when I go out to distance with it and I'm, I'm validating on, on uh, steel or paper, whatever I'm doing. I've shot that gun. I shot it. We just shot it the other day, yep. right? You just focus on the shot. Yeah. Yep. Nothing else really crosses nope. your mind. And that's why it is so stellar. And like you said, you get back on target, you know, usually, you know, shoot the old 300 wisdoms. What happened? Yep. Eyeballs got to stop rattling right. around. Same thing with that Kimber 308. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, a, that one's snappy. I love the gun because it weighs nothing and it's like a, it's like a broomstick, but it sucks to shoot. And I really like shooting that Tika. Well, 
you know, and we talk about and we're, stuff we brought up before. We're going to bring it up again. We'll probably bring up a lot of this stuff in yeah. future, you know, talks like this. Um, but the more that I think about shooting critters at, you know, maybe not like extremely long range, but, you know, I guess longer than I used to shoot before dialing turrets and things like that, the ability to watch your impact, uh, to see how the animal reacts, to see where you hit the animal, particularly if you're hunting on your own, is extremely important. Because if you have to, if after a shot, a longer shot, let's say, you know, four to 600 yards, let's say, if the animal disappears and you don't know what happened, you don't know what happened. No. And I've had that. I, I used to shoot a 300 Weatherby. I was obsessed with the cartridge for pronghorn and mule deer. And you come off that gun. That has no break. It was a lightweight gun. Pull the trigger. If I missed... I'm looking at the dust and trying to figure out where that dust cloud was relative to where that pronghorn was standing. And it ain't standing there anymore. Um, you know, and it was a hard gun to get confident with. And this is, you know, the 6.5 Greenmore. A lot of, lot of hat tip into that cartridge for getting me off that Magnumania train. And I think making me a better shooter or allowing me to shoot more. Uh, right. Without, you know, beating up my collarbone or, or beating up my wallet. Uh then, yeah, you probably would shoot, go back and shoot that 300 Weatherby better because sure. yeah. you've shot a lot more. Sure. I try not to shoot that 300 Weatherby. <laughs> do, do you still have it? Oh, yeah. 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 I try not to shoot that one. I don't know. I feel like, so in the, uh, when we did the, the video portion of this, you know, the 6.5 edged out the 308. Sure. I think they're both still fine cartridges. Absolutely. Um, I think even after dissecting the gel blocks literally and this topic a little bit more if you said if you said mark you don't own a rifle right now and you're going to purchase a 65 or a 308 i'd probably get a 65 i don't think it's a bad choice but I, I, in the same breath i think i would darn near equally be happy with a 308 i also agree with that hence both, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's that. That's another part too. Like, I hope if anybody's listening to this and you, you are in that position, you don't have a rifle yet, and this is going to tell you which way to go. Neither are a bad choice. No, and they're pitted here together exactly for that reason, right? Um, it's a tough call. Like, I could e you could throw this in the mix. Like, talk about you know potential variables at play. My dad and, uh, let's say, my dad and my brother have 308s already. They shoot great, and they love, you know, X type of ammo. That could probably just sway me to get a 308 instead. Absolutely. Yep. Same ammo. Cool. Everybody's good to go. We're all on the same page. You know, like, yeah. We've spun in circles once again, come back to the same spot. Oh, it's a lot of fun, though. I mean, we learned a lot. I've been shooting a long time and reloading a long time, and I learned a lot. Anything we missed in this, talking about these today? Big takeaway, again for me, ballistic gelatin is an imperfect medium to test into. Mm -hmm. um, changing a bullet will change these results and can change these results dramatically. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of options. I'd love nothing more than to have every one <sighs> of them. And I want 10 blocks for each bullet, and I want to shoot them and get a much bigger sample size and go through it so that I can find definitively the best projectile for a given cartridge or the best cartridge for a given application or just the king of all cartridges. Love to do that. Uh, at the end of the day, I still got to talk about scopes and uh, things like that, right? Um, so individual results may vary. Uh, I hope. Hopefully we've provided some... Uh some insight. Yeah. You know, a little a little, a little deeper insight. Uh, if you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, give it a, give the channel a sub. If you haven't watched the YouTube video, watch that. Uh, because gel, um, gel's shockingly expensive and we want to do a lot more of these. So the more people like and share and watch and view, uh, the more selfishly we get to do please 10 likes <laughs> 10 likes 10 likes ryan will do anything 
Uh, the good news is, though, this gel is recyclable. This is true. Yes. So uh, custom forms uh, are on the way. We're going to figure out how to melt it down, reclarify it, strain it, cast it into another block, and continue on with this. And move, move forward. Yeah. Shoot more gels. Mark, I had a lot of fun doing this. I feel this was kind of a dream come true for you. It really was. I, I mean, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Yeah. But I think if if we were going to gauge like excitement levels off the go, yeah. like, you know, if I was here, you were like not in the stratosphere. When when you and Jimmy said, hey, uh, please get a napkin out and draw a cartridge and then make it into a gun, I was pretty jazzed. <clears throat> now that we're shooting into Jello, I'm also very jazzed. This is a lot of, this is cool stuff. And it, like I said, it is very enlightening to me. I had expectations. Sometimes they were exceeded. Sometimes they were not met. And it's it's forcing me to rethink what I thought was the best choice. Yeah. Like definitely there was a few times throughout where I'm like, oh, now I have another question. So. Yeah. And if you have those questions, holler at us, please. Yes. Let us know your questions. Comment. Did you, you know, did you like this? What do you want to see? What do you want to see more of? Do you need clarification on something else? Did we miss something? Do you have personal experience with something where you've seen uh, a similar result, different result? Uh, this is all, it's all information. They're all data points. Yep. So uh, let us know. Until next time, shoot straight. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.